So good morning once again to you all. A big welcome to Riga and especially to our fantastic new library. Um, let it not be said that, uh, that Latvia doesn't observe gender balance because to open the, the conference we have three extremely powerful uh, women in Latvian politics and um, we must uh, reinforce how um, significant this conference is for Latvia uh, because of the, the presence uh, of the Speaker of our Parliament, the Saima, the Minister of Culture, our former President, Vairavik Freiberg, and of course, Solvit Abolting, uh, Chair of the Parliamentary Committee on National Security. So, uh, first, I would like to invite um, the Speaker of the Saima, Inara Munet, to address you. Good morning to everyone. Madam Minister, ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues. I heartily welcome you to Riga and the audiovisual conference devoted to strengthening media field and common European identity. This conference is organized by the Ministry of Culture within the framework of Latvian Presidency of the Council of the EU. And it is very timely and relevant addition to the broad set of thematic events organized by our presidency. Some of the finest European experts and local professionals are present at this conference. Therefore, this event has a great potential to generate ideas, consolidate opinions, and arrive at strong conclusions and recommendations. I would like to comment on a couple of issues on the impressive agenda of this two-day event. The Latvian Presidency is closely tied with the upcoming developments in the Audiovisual Media Services Directive. And one of the questions set for today's discussions is as follows. Does the Audiovisual Media Services Directive take into account the rapid technological developments and new business models? While it introducing amendments into the national broadcast legislation, the Latvian Parliament identified challenges facing the Latvian media market. The Latvian media market is under a risk to become extinct. Latvian language broadcasters, a very few of them which are still left, are struggling against the overwhelming and even suffocating effect of broadcasts in the Russian language. Part of them, because of events in Ukraine, have become increasingly hostile. In this context, it is particularly important to find viable tools that should be included in the directive. The country of origin principle in audiovisual media services is being introduced in equally challenging circumstances. Legal aspects of all the criteria that define a country as a country of origin have to be fully understood and classified in a more precise manner. I'm looking forward to the parallel working groups that will focus on ways to strengthen the independence of regulators to deliberate on whether it is possible to introduce a single European standard that would ensure technical compatibility and seek ways to improve consumers' accessibility to and availability of the desired content. We all are looking forward to the innovations brought by technical progress. However, in reality, a politically independent, highly professional, legally supported and institutionally equipped regulator is the cornerstone of a fully functional national broadcast environment. To explain the actual situation in which this event is taking place, I would like to emphasize the following. 
in a perfect world. The media would be mentioned exclusively with reference to freedom of expression, freedom of thought, freedom of speech, as well as in the context of the topic of today's discussion, namely technical aspects of a free media market and ways to perfect broadcasting. As a former journalist myself, which I still am in my heart and in my thinking, I would prefer to indulge in, in, in a discussion on legislation aimed at improving a consumer-oriented broadcasting. I would be happy to talk only about the professionalism of media that ensures the best quality of the finest media product. Today's conference examines the need to strengthen the European audiovisual media market so that it can respond to the challenges of rapid technological advances, increasing global competition and changing consumer habits. These are topics of the highest importance. However, we do not, we do not live in a perfect world. Moreover, the geopolitical developments show that a dangerous reality affects both the content and technical operation of media. Sometimes we can observe a total misuse of media tools and operation. The issue of media pluralism in the current geopolitical situation is also closely linked with the threatening situation caused by Russia in eastern Ukraine. In this regard, I would like to refer to a recent remark by Martin Lindegaard, Denmark's Minister for Foreign Affairs, who concerning situation in Nordic and Baltic states, in his interview for Reuters said the following, you have massive propaganda, provocations, stimulation of groups inside other countries, which is not warfare, but which is very hostile and close to warfare. We have to admit that Europe is confused by hybrid warfare, which is using broadcasts as one of the hostile operation tools. However, I have always believed, and I still firmly believe, in our ability to find the right solutions. Since this conference is attended by an array of distinguished speakers, it has great potential to find the right and necessary solutions. I wish all of you my best and may you have a fruitful discussion. Thank you for your attention. And now, uh, please give a warm welcome uh, to the Latvian Minister of Culture, Datem Elbad. And you will be, it, it is interesting to note that uh, among all her other responsibilities, I think from September last year, uh, the Ministry of Culture has been given the brief of media policy. I think we were the last in, in the European Union to have a specific department, but this, of course, has placed an enormous responsibility on what is a, a, a quite, quite modestly sized uh, ministry. Please, Minister. Honourable Madam Speaker of the Saima, in our morning, Honourable Dr. Vairaviti Freiberg, Honourable Madam Chair of the National Security Committee of the Saima Solita Bultinia, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, Labrit, Cienitas Dams, Gudate Kungi. Good morning, dear ladies and gentlemen. On the opening day of the Creativity Week, great. Uh, in collaboration with the British Council, French Institute, Danish Cultural Institute, Goethe Institute, and the Nordic Council of Ministers, we launched the tradition of the Creativity Week.
five years ago uh, with an aim to deepen public comprehension uh, of the importance of, creativ uh, of creative diversity uh, for sustainable growth in both Latvia and uh, Europe as a whole. Inviting you to participate in the Latvian Presidency Conference on the strengthening of the European audiovisual media market for the development of the European identity, we have invited you to discuss the challenges of the digital single market. However, most importantly, we have invited you to discuss the issues of European values and cultural space. The audiovisual sector in the contemporary Europe is both a growing creative industry and a tremendous opportunity for creative works. At the same time, it is also a space for freedom expression and linguistic diversity. The medium is a message, proposed Marshall McLuhan, the scholar who paved the way to the contemporary understanding of the mass media. He said that a media affects the society in which it plays a role, not only through the content delivered over the medium, but also through the characteristics of the medium itself. There is no doubt that the media and information are powerful shapers of the views and lifestyles of the society in that they influence the opinions, choices and actions of individuals. To illustrate, through words, symbols and sounds, they can promote humanity and solidarity by collecting donations to save the life of a child. However, media can also promote hatred and violence that achieve the opposite by taking away lives. Therefore, in the public space, especially in the context of the tragic incident in Paris, the question of editorial responsibility for media content becomes more and more acute. Dear conference participants, the rapid development of the digital market and technologies, as well as the aggravation of international tension and the radicalization of some sectors of um, society, influences the present and the future of European audiovisual policy. To further develop our shared audiovisual environment, we need a common action to protect both the safety of the European information space and uh, shared values of Europe. However, I wouldn't want to question the basic postulates of European audiovisual policy that clearly set uh, out the main rules for the European audiovisual market while acknowledging its intrinsic connection with the culture as well as marketing out the main objectives and directions of the development of the sector. At the main pillar of European audiovisual policy, the audiovisual media service directive must continue to serve as a strong basis for the free movement of audiovisual services in, in, in the European community. At that point, I fully support the efforts of my European colleagues to strengthen the market of the media and audiovisual services. In November 2014, the Council of Ministers unanimously invited the European Commission to urgently review the Audiovisual Media Service Directive. And I'd like to thank you, the European Commissioner, Mr. Oettinger, for hearing this call and bringing it further to the European Parliament, where the Commissioner confirmed the ambition to complete work on the refit exercise by the end of 2015. Any review of audiovisual regulation must take into account the actions carried out by ministers responsible for uh, foreign policy, as well as the European External Action Service, because they are leading the discussion on the European Strategic Communication Plan in response to the geopolitical changes. There is also the need uh, to be aware of the fact that European audiovisual and media policy has a direct impact on the national security of the member states, as Madame Murnietze mentioned before. Dear guests, the destructive invasion of our closest Eastern partnership country, Ukraine, 
the brutal assault at the Charlie Hebdo office in Paris, the attack on people discussing freedom of expression in Copenhagen, the efforts of the jihadists to radicalize European youth, and other such situations are sharp reminder that in the contemporary Europe, the conflict of different worldviews and values become more and more intense. It reinforces the importance of our task to find ways to protect the European media space against the attacks that aim to radicalize and systematically feed our public with lies and disinformation. It had reached the extent that takes the shape of propaganda that cultivates hatred and undermines confidence in European democracy and the idea of European unity, as well as poses a threat to the security of European countries and citizens. During the conference and in the further discussions in the Council of the European Union, we should look for new support tools to strengthen European audiovisual media and to increase competitiveness of the European Union's media content. At the same time, I invite you to discuss what is a genuine European Union audiovisual media service provider. Is it the one who, without any editorial responsibility, only uploads the signal to one of the European satellites? Or is it the one who bears the responsibility for editorial decisions about the content and what is being broadcast in Europe? The second issue I want to raise today is how to strengthen independent media regulators in European Union and how to create an effective, responsive network of European regulators so that mechanisms of independent media monitoring could effectively operate with respect to any language or content of the message. Thirdly, I invite you to discuss how to create a rapid response mechanism to ensure prompt reaction to threats that may arise in order to protect children or national security, especially with regard to non-European content containing messages that threaten our democratic values and contain hate speech. Dear participants of the conference, these are complicated and complex issues. At the same time, they call for an urgent response. And let me in advance to express my gratitude for your interest, enthusiasm and contribution to the planned discussions as well as for your work to prepare such proposals that could strengthen the European audiovisual market and information space. The discussions which will take place next two days will be summarized and during the Latvian presidency uh, they will well feed into further discussions at the European level and in those with other European cooperation partners. I am convinced that by working together and with a strong common commitment to our shared audiovisual space, we, we will be able to protect the European value of freedom, which the world-renowned Riga Bern political philosopher, Isaiah Berlin, considered to be the most important pillar in front of which any desire to, to support terrorism and authoritarianism capitulates. I thank you for your attention. Thank you, Minister. Uh, it now falls on me to introduce uh, the speaker for the uh, keynote speech. Uh, this is former President of Latvia, Madam Vaira Vike Freiberg, who was also chair of the high-level group on freedom and pluralism of the media in the European Union. Uh, we are very lucky to have Vaira Vike Freiberg here today because um, he, when she left uh, the presidency of Latvia, her workload became even greater. She's flying all over the world, uh, lecturing and giving advice. So I'm personally very, very happy to, to welcome uh, Madam Vik Freiberg. The floor is yours.
Honourable Speaker of the Saima, dear Madam Minister, Honourable Parliamentarians, ladies and gentlemen, I feel honoured to be here and to represent the high level group uh, whose report is one of the two documents which have been brought to your attention and hopefully will help to inform the debates that you will have during this conference. The summary and key findings of our particular group are of course available uh, on the internet and I have them here uh, with me but I will not go into um, detailed discussion of them, time does not allow it. We have quite a number of recommendations which are framed within the general constraints that we had. We had quite a lively debate uh, for a substantial length of time about the general principles, the conceptual framework within which we should look at media freedom and plurality. And I would just like to summarize here briefly some of these background considerations because you will be coming back to them uh, later in more detail in your uh, further discussions. One, the media provide information. And information is an essential ingredient, indeed a basic pillar of democracy. If democracy means the participation of every citizen in political processes and having a say uh, directly or indirectly in the decisions uh, that are taken and that affect the public good, then of course a democracy is only as strong uh, and only as solid as this flow of information uh, from the world at large uh, to the citizen. Ideally, the citizen should be sufficiently informed about what is happening in their country, uh, in their region, in their city and town, uh, to understand the different offers that political parties uh, might be presenting in the next elections and make an informed and hopefully enlightened choice when time comes to cast their ballots since, of course, for practical reasons, few countries like, Sw like Switzerland uh, can afford to uh, give every um, major decision to uh, the popular referendum vote. We do have representative democracies. But what this means is that the media, uh, the medium, as McLuhan said, is indeed the message in the sense that no medium reflects reality to its fullest. Reality is a buzzing, blooming confusion of enormous amounts of facts, events, uh, sensory in input and information. And I, I remember a, a news director from Al Jazeera reminding a conference in the Middle East that even in a case where the media try to be as objective as they can in reporting what is happening somewhere where say there's an uprising, there's a uh, public protest and so on, a camera can only point in one direction and only take in a certain frame. There may be lots of things going on beyond the frame of the camera that at that moment will not be reflected. That means that the media have a selective a selective influence that is absolutely inevitable by the simple facts of life. And secondly, the media has a selective influence on what you perceive as a citizen, as an ordinary human being, because uh, the events are to be interpreted. If you had just a raw flow of events, you would be totally confused and nobody would want that. The media typically have an editorial policy. They typically have certain leanings. They have possibly some certain uh, political preferences. Uh, and the public should be informed about what kind of medium uh, they are dealing with, where their information comes from. In other words, what one of the recommendations that we come up with is that there should be full disclosure and transparency about the ownership of the media uh, uh, because we know from a Leveson inquiry in Great Britain uh, that uh, media moguls like, uh, like Mr. Murdoch have openly uh, bragged uh, to all who would hear uh, that uh, they and their publications uh, having accumulated uh, a rather a monopoly on the most important and most popular publications in Great Britain, 
that they feel that they have actually put in place, as Mr. Murdoch puts it, the last three prime ministers, and not all of them from the same party either. In other words, that here you have a media mogul boasting in his old age uh, that his lifelong, uh, he has been uh, unduly influencing political processes, and that is not what we would like to see in a democracy. And then, of course, you have the normal and usual concerns about autocratic uh, authoritarian regimes taking political control of the media, and that, of course, is the greatest danger uh, in countries where democracy does not reign. That means that uh, the government uh, or the president or the leader, ruling clique or the, or the uh, ruling military junta, as the case may be, uh, have total control uh, of all the media and shape uh, to their advantage all the news that the citizen receives. And the citizen, therefore, is submitted to continual brainwashing, if not neurolinguistic programming, to the extent that they become like zombies who simply um, think in a certain direction where they have been manipulated, into which they have been pushed. Uh, and when we talk about uh, their free choice in elections, if they're by any chance uh, they are given for show, uh, and for pretense uh, several candidates uh, to choose from, then it's very clear in advance, and we know I could name any number of countries where this is clear in advance who will win the elections because either some parties have not been allowed to register, uh, others uh, leaders have been put in jail, others have been shot or killed, and so on and so forth. But I'd like to go back and to remind you that political authoritarianism is a major impediment to producing a knowledge society with informed citizens who can use to the fullest their democratic rights. However, uh, money, if you like, in one word, money is another source of uh, change of the content of information, of shaping uh, its uh, direction, tone, uh, and uh, ultimate hidden message, sometimes very cleverly hidden. Uh, and it is most definitely not to the advantage of media plurality if, uh, as we have countries in the European Union where all the written press belongs to the same media concern uh, and where the uh, plurality of opinions is assured by editorial freedom uh, which the owners claim they leave to their editors of each particular say, uh, printed uh, press publication. That is all very nice, but one wonders if one day the interests of this media concern should be threatened in one way or another, how open they will be and how assured we can be that they will not interfere like Mr. Murdoch did in shaping the politics of the country. We do have countries, uh, again, where the television media are concentrated in a very band of, a narrow band of owners. Sometimes it's a single, again, conglomerate uh, that owns it. And it is dangerous when you have a conglomerate, for instance, that is all in the hands of the uh, defense industry or, or, or the uh, arms manufacturing industry. This is not the sort of phenomenon that ideally you would like to see, even though supposedly the editors and so on uh, are given editorial freedom. That is, of course, the big if. Do we have, in addition to the freedom of expression, in addition to uh, the uh, professionalism of the journalists involved, uh, uh, do we have editorial freedom for them? And then finally we come also to the quality the quality of the journalism uh, and the reporting that we get, and I'm talking about media as a whole, maybe uh, traditionally, of course, uh, the printed media are our old model, it's the oldest one, but of course television and radio have been around for a long time, and the new social media and all the others and internet have made enormous changes in the way we communicate with each other. New business models are being born, uh, new conditions uh, for the creation of content uh, are being uh, uh, created, and uh, the journalistic quality is linked to these considerations. One example, uh, concerns from the journalists' uh, um, union uh, of the European uh, Union countries. 
Journalists are concerned about their job security because if, say, they work as reporting uh, uh, and investigative journalists for a printed medium, and uh, they discover that the printing media keeps losing money uh, and has uh, sort of mitigated success in entering the market in competition uh, with media uh, portals on the internet and so on, this job security of journalists is threatened and the very existence of investigative journalism which is not journalism where you wake up in the morning you produce a paper by, by uh, two hours later and it's published the next night uh, but where it takes maybe a month and more or several months or even a year to collect the background information to get an in-depth investigation of some um, issue of social importance if there is no job security for these journalists, then obviously investigative journalism as such becomes under danger. And then, of course, uh, the ethics of journalists uh, are something that needs to be considered as much as the ethics of politicians. We sometimes tend to take uh, and assume that the only concern is the unethical politicians, and we take for granted that uh, automatically all journalists are born honest, um, uh, immune uh, to corruption, uh, to distortion. Uh, they are sages, uh, philosophers, and, and wise men, and, and we can always count on them. But a Plus, they're only human and they're just as human as politicians and, and civil servants and parliamentarians and anybody else. So that there must be some sort of feedback mechanism whereby journalistic ethics can also put, be put under scrutiny and this is for instance what happened in England uh, with the Leveson inquiry. And I might tell you that when we produced our report, our group, we received glowing uh, reports uh, uh, in the press uh, and uh, elogious evaluations uh, of the quality of this report in the French press. But in the British press, they thought that there was Europe interfering and telling journalists what to do, which is not, if you read the recommendations of a report, you see this is not the case. But this brings me to a very important point. Uh, we, we are all gathered here within the framework of a European Union uh, conference uh, of, uh, of trying to look for solutions at the European level. And we must, of course, be aware that the treaties uh, that bind uh, our legal uh, possibilities, uh, the treaties are very limiting with respect to the possibility of interfering in the media sector. The media sector, there are few directives and few points that address it. And this is, I was so uh, happy to have two very distinguished legal minds on the committee that I chaired, uh, because we spent a lot of time uh, trying to find ways in which legitimately, even without changing the treaties, the European Union and its institutions and under existing treaty provisions could uh, put up mechanisms, uh, recommend uh, measures to be taken in individual measure in uh, member countries, and uh, respond to what is a problem in terms of maintaining democracy, plurality, uh, and uh, defend uh, populations against one-sided propaganda. But in recent events, as previous speakers have alluded to, uh, it is not just the situation of having an informed citizen who can perform uh, in a hopefully rational way in the next elections or as rational as he's able or she, uh, what we do have now uh, is actually a hybrid war going on where information is becoming a tool of war. Uh, in a few days, uh, after a number of other countries, I will be going to The Hague uh, where I've been representing Eastern Europe on the Trust Fund for Victims of uh, the International Criminal Court which pursues crimes against humanity, genocide and so on and so on. Well, we have found in that context that, for instance, women and children uh, frequently are specially targeted and sexual violence against women and children is, is being used as a tool of war, of intimidation, uh, of, of uh, ethnic cleansing and so forth. But nowadays it has become uh, the case 
that information also has become a tool of war. And when you have certain countries which are using their uh, control of their media in their own countries to zombie and to, and, and to brainwash their own citizens, that is bad enough. But in a situation that we have in Europe, we now have the possibility for third countries from outside of the Union uh, to uh, take up residence, as it were, and to start broadcasting, say, television programs from somewhere in Britain or, or Ireland or somewhere else. And these are programs that are aimed at populations in an entirely different part of Europe, such as, say, Latvia and Estonia. And it's very difficult uh, for the uh, audiences, the target audiences, and, and their rep political representatives to do anything about it. I think this is a concern for Europe, because then Europe should not be like a wet noodle simply sitting there and accepting propaganda from uh, all quarters, uh, wherever they may come from, uh, having propaganda uh, and information being used as a tool of hybrid war, uh, and simply in the name of our, all that uh, we hold dear, uh, uh, sitting back uh, and, and uh, heaving deep sighs, uh, and throwing up our arms and saying, well, it's too bad. You see, there's, there's nothing we can do about it. I think we can do something. As I say, we racked our brains uh, to try and come up with measures that we have put down in these recommendations that we have in our report. I am sure that uh, those of you who are here belong to that a uh, large group of concerned people who also have wrapped their brains about what can be done uh, to make the information space truly what it ought to be. It ought to be, as I have been emphasizing, a pillar of democracy, but that is not all. It also ought to be a pillar of civic consciousness, civic pride, and the uh, establishing and deepening of the individual's anchoring in their culture and in their identity. We have a motto in Europe about strength in diversity. That means that the diversity of our languages and cultures, even as the uh, common values that we hold dear, both have to be supported at the same time. And it's a, it's a challenge because uh, in many ways uh, uh, they come sometimes in contradiction. For instance, small countries with small numbers of speakers uh, of a certain language, of course, are commercially more expensive per capita uh, to create programs than, say, programs done in English or in Russian, which have vast uh, audiences internationally uh, and can be, and, and for this reason, uh, are, uh, if you like, for the producers, are more profitable uh, to present. But Europe does need its own, we are always uh, submitting ourselves to foreign propaganda, but we always feel, because of our values, that we mustn't say anything in return, that we must passively just listen to everything. Passively listening to dangerous thoughts, having on the internet recipes for making Molotov cocktails and bombs, having on the internet child pornography, or uh, scenes uh, describing how to be more sadistic uh, or, and even uh, take le lethal measures uh, against women in sexual encounters, that sort of thing uh, is not uh, part of the plurality uh, and freedom of expression that, if you like, the founders of all the principles that we hold dear ever had in mind. Uh, every country does now have laws and rules and regulations, and Interpol has certain liberties uh, of action that they have been uh, allocated to control child prostitution, child pornography, uh, slavery, and, and trade in human beings, etc., etc. There are any number of ills uh, that do have to be controlled. There has to be a certain amount of filtering of information, but it is a very de de delicate thing to make sure that this filtering does not become either in political, in uh, sectorial, uh, in fanatical religious, uh, or in economic interests. Uh, the balance is very difficult. It's something that we have to keep vigilant about. We have to keep working on it. And ladies and gentlemen, here is a challenge for you. Within the framework of the existing treaties, without going to that enormous and, and almost hopeless process of rewriting the treaties, how to find means and ways within each member country of the European Union 
and in the Union as a whole, how to find ways of making sure that the media perform a positive service to our uh, populations, uh, that they help them in establishing their own sense of identity, their belongingness and their roots in their country and in their culture, that they help to preserve uh, big languages and small, uh, that they inform citizens about the rest of Europe and that sense of solidarity that politicians sometimes uh, almost give up hope uh, of establishing, that the populations from the grassroots up would have a sense of uh, sympathy, of empathy, and of understanding between the North and the South, the East and the West, the old and the new, and, 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 and the babies and the old people, and the women and men, etc., etc. This sort of thing is some, uh, we have these ideals that we have to defend, but we have to look to practical means how to put them in place. In this, ladies and gentlemen, you have a challenge before you, and I offer you my very best wishes for success. Um, thank you very, very much, um, Vaira. Before we begin the second, uh, the first plenary, we have presents for you.